A return to the Hawaiian Islands was, of course, one of the main stories of this year's Qualcomm Snapdragon Summit. And I swear, the Hawaiian Islands are right outside this door, even though I can't really expose for it in this shot. But Qualcomm also brought quite a lot of great news along with them that are quite exciting. So let's talk about some of the top takeaways from the event. This is Joshua Fagar. What's going on, everybody? Here are my top five takeaways from the Snapdragon Summit. Now, a quick disclaimer, there are so many pieces of news and announcements from Qualcomm that I couldn't possibly do a deep dive that covers it all, so I will be talking about what specifically really stood out to me. And we're going to keep it casual for most of them because I really want to get to what I'm really jazzed about. Because if you think about it, the latest Snapdragon processors announced each and every year have a bit of a running theme. Upgrades, optimization, and continual pushing of the envelope. This year, in many ways, that's just no different. And every year we always speculate what the next name will be, yet Qualcomm just decided to revamp the entire naming convention this year. Why is this a big takeaway? Because tech creators like me will have to adjust our spec talk, and you'll be hearing about it a lot moving forward. While it might take some getting used to, we now have the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, and that name kind of makes sense after you think about it. You see, the 8 series has clearly been the flagship Qualcomm SoC for a couple of years now, with things like the Snapdragon 765 bringing a great measure of that power to generally lower priced devices. While there wasn't a full word from anyone if the other processor tiers will get the same naming treatment, I personally don't see why not. I mean, we could get things like Snapdragon 7 or 6 or 5, and that's pretty easy to understand as long as they don't go too crazy with these slight variants. And of course, every year, there's a new gen. So while the chip itself might not be some radical change, it's still a continued building block. It's just that there's now a new way of identifying the chip, and that marks a new era. That's not to say the new processor isn't packing some newness though. One of my favorite demos actually happened a little while ago during a Snapdragon Sound event where we were able to watch Steve Aoki in New York. A lot of that was brought to the Snapdragon Summit, but what matters is that the Snapdragon Sound enhancements are now given a home that we can look forward to experiencing, and that's of course the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. There are a few really cool details. AI noise reduction is a big one, and some live demos had live reduction happening even when the presenters had things like keyboards or potato chip bags potentially ruining the input. It was a little loud for getting the final result in that room, so I don't have the audio in this clip, but you can see in the waveforms that most of the noise has been reduced, and it was actually quite effective. Another rather specific use case scenario is when you're gaming. Now, if you're in a mobile game and you're like talking on Discord, for example, the audio from the game causes an effect called howling. The same thing happens when you're in video calls and you hear yourself due to the feedback. Snapdragon Sound has AI help figure out where and how it's happening, minimizing it all for a better voice experience. The biggest update from Snapdragon Sound that we could see more in the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 will be lossless audio. This is exciting. This is what was announced during the Steve Aoki event to be fair, but I do still have to talk about it because being a constant audio listener and a wireless audio fan, I know that there has always been a discrepancy between wired and wireless quality. And thus far, only Qualcomm are trying to create codecs and sound experiences that rival the lossless quality that you might experience with, say, a powerful pair of headphones either plugged directly to your audio player or amp, or for a throwback, plugged into like an old school CD player, because that is still considered one of the standards of what is proper sound quality. While streaming services and headphone companies will have to bridge the various gaps to actually create the full lossless audio experience, it is great to hear that we're actually on the way there. But as for what we can see, and of course, capture, that's where Snapdragon Sight comes in. While I would usually go a bit more in-depth on the camera enhancements provided by the latest Snapdragon processors, I do have to admit that right now, uh, I feel like I'm experiencing the best already of what we've had in smartphone photo and video thus far. Things like 4K, HDR, high frame rate, and great colors, all tuned by these chips already, uh, helps to support all of my creative work. I mean, we do have 8K HDR video recording, getting a boost with multi-frame capture that merges multiple streams into one awesome looking video. You get features like bokeh video uh, that is being done more efficiently on the chip level, bringing a better portrait style video. And here's a cool one. Uh, this one's backed up by an honestly gnarly looking set of camera hardware, but the fact that the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 can capture from multiple sensors at once, uh, this is taken further when you get things like live one-shot panoramas captured by using two of the wide sensors to achieve the super wide result. And by the way, the fact that you can see the feed live from the two sensors at the exact exact same time means that, of course, this live panorama can also be used for things like video. 
like a lot of the other, let's say, sub brands uh, that Qualcomm is creating so that you can easily uh, understand the different experiences that Snapdragon brings to the table, Snapdragon Sight is a consolidation of these kinds of camera enhancements. Every year we get more and more out of the cameras that are in our pockets, and this year, of course, it was no different. Now on the laptop front, the Snapdragon 8CX Gen 3 continues Qualcomm's foray into a slightly larger form of mobile technology. The latest version of the chip brings even better efficiency with a 5 nanometer process size and it comes with gains in battery life and speed. The presentation actually compared the 8CX Gen 3 uh, to an Intel Core i5 processor, which should tell you plenty about what kind of user might benefit the most from these kinds of laptops. Productivity and work on the go without needing a plug too often has always been a core facet of connected notebooks, but that doesn't mean you can't use key applications on these platforms. Apps like Photoshop from Adobe and Shaper 3D are getting support and development to work on the HCX Gen 3. Now, gaming can happen on these laptops supporting these chipsets, but when it comes to everyday productivity, media consumption, and long-lasting usage, Qualcomm has their specific focuses when it comes to this laptop processor. And the line continues to get its support now with Gen 3. Besides, if you're looking for gaming from Qualcomm, they're actually putting some very concerted efforts into something that I think is really special with the Snapdragon G3X Gen 1. And this was what I was really excited to spend time with. See, the G3X Gen 1 is not just a new chip, it's a complete gaming platform. Sometimes Qualcomm does create concepts and in-house hardware that are basically their vision of what those categories of products can look like. They did it for drones, literally creating drones and optimizing the sensors for flying um, and sending them out to OEM so that they know what the blueprint can be like. And now they're doing it for mobile gaming, showing how something like this can be constructed. And you know what? They're already almost there because this feels like a full product, due in part because of this G3X handheld developer kit made in collaboration with Razer. I mean, Razer already has some products that support the mobile gaming experience, and now this is like a full-blown console built from the ground up. Sure, the software guts might still be Android, and there are still plenty of little details around the console that are like smartphone forward, but the integrated controller, the high refresh rate display, and the fact that this G3X Gen 1 comes equipped with cooling solutions, it all means that gaming on your more traditional smartphones has just been completely eclipsed. And let me tell you, this is a complete kit, more comfortable than any controller solution that I've ever used. It kind of makes sense that Razer was at the helm here because inspirations from their Kishi controller are pretty apparent. The triggers feel really good, the buttons are nice and meaty, and the screen is just at the right size for enjoyment. If this developer kit is supposed to inform and inspire all of the manufacturers to create their versions of a kit like this, well, this is one hell of a blueprint. And regardless of how you feel about mobile gaming, it is the fastest growing category in the world. It's already huge and it just continues to grow. Game developers are putting a lot of effort now into making good games for the thing that's in your pocket. But any of those bottlenecks that you might run into, whether it be with the performance, the display, the controls, now those are all addressed in this handheld developer kit and devices that might look a lot like it. Titles like Diablo Immortal and the just released Rocket League Sideswipe are great examples of the IPs that are coming out for mobile. Sure, we might have gaming phones, but they are still trying to be kind of like a split personality. This handheld developer kit is a more focused effort. Let's think of it this way. If we have tablets that have specific use cases in our daily tech lives, well, then this falls pretty much in that kind of product category. So I think it makes perfect sense. And it's not like you're sacrificing a whole lot from the smartphone blueprint. There's still things like a front-facing camera. You can throw a micro SD card inside of it and applications from the Play Store can be installed just like you would on any other Android phone. And speaking of which, you can go beyond the Play Store and with Wi-Fi 6 or 5G millimeter wave connectivity, you can play pretty much any game using game game streaming platforms like Xbox Game Pass, or let's say um, remote play from PlayStation, or even use Parsec to play your games remotely from your PC. I think Razer needs to make this handheld developer kit into a full-blown product yesterday, and I wouldn't be surprised if they do it eventually. There's always a lot to look forward to at and, of course, after each Snapdragon Summit, and this year it's no different. There's a common discussion after these shows around which manufacturers will flip certain switches, but the fact remains that Qualcomm provides so many switches. That is why my takeaways this year are more about Qualcomm's general strategies around the various products that they announced, and on one particular development, of course, that, like every other announcement, just can't become a reality soon enough.
For more about Qualcomm's technologies, what was announced here at the Snapdragon Summit, and of course all of the products that these processors are going to power, make sure you subscribe to my channel. Uh, let me know what you think by dropping some likes on this video and jumping into the comment section down below. With all of that said though, I'm going to go ahead and call it on this one. Thank you so much for watching. Please take care of yourselves and each other and enjoy your tea everybody.